When I was preparing for this, I realized I had done a lot of talks. I'd even done a few keynote speeches. But I thought, this is special, this is different. I'm not talking to a bunch of musicians, you know, I have to really be on my game. So I actually wrote a speech. First time ever in my life I wrote one. Until I had breakfast with Matt. And in talking to him, I realized writing and saying speeches is not what I do. I just like to talk. And I like to play. So this won't quite be a commencement speech, it'll be a commencement talk. Is that all right? So as Matt said, I played music most of my whole life. I was born into it. And it's true, I've gotten a lot of awards. I've been praised. And I say that anybody born in my situation would be just as good. So I don't really look at that. I appreciate the fact that people love what I do because I would do it anyway. But the fact that my peers love it is a bonus. But as my parents always said, they weren't, con more, they weren't so concerned about what we did, but they were concerned with who we are, who we were as people. And if what we did didn't make us better people and make those around us better people, they questioned whether it was worth doing. So when we were little kids and getting awards and things like that and getting praise, because I mean, we were young when we were doing a lot of these kind of cool things. And people don't always, you know, credit the parents and things. And my parents will say, well, as much as they play, they should be good. We don't care about that. Who wouldn't be good, right? But it's who they are as people is what we're concerned at. So I want to start with a quote that my mom would always say to us, boy. They would ask the five of us, they would say, what does the world need with just another good musician? Mom would say, we have plenty. What the world needs is good people. So they would say, if we're going to spend all these hours in the practice room, all this time at school studying, don't stop doing it. Just make sure it's making you good people. So I'd ask you the same thing. What does the world need with just another Rubenstein graduate? There's been over 4,000, right? <laughs> what the world needs is good people. What the world needs is you, right? When you were born, and everybody here kind of knows what it took to become born. I don't have to go through that, right? But if you realize we've already won the most 
amazing race we will ever win. The most amazing race we will ever enter, enter into. We've already won it. So we're already born special. We're born winners. You have a fingerprint that's never been here on the planet. In the, in the existence of the history of humankind, your fingerprint has never been here and will never be here again. That's special. Cool thing is no one can take that away from you. Your job is to improve on that specialness and present it to the world. Now we present it to the world by what we do. But it always comes back to who you are. How you relate to people. Because when you leave here, believe it or not, the people more than likely you're going to associate with, some of them are sitting right next to you. So it's how they see you today. Might determine how they see you tomorrow. In your journeys, as you leave here, this is a happy moment. But all the moments that come forth may not be that happy. The bad things will happen in life, but I want you to look at it maybe in a different way. When bad things happen in life, they jump out at us, they grab us, they grab our attention. And the press and the world would make us think that everything is bad, but the bad things jump out at us because they're not normal. Right? We have to remember that the world is a beautiful place and we are beautiful people. Because the, because the bad things jump out at us, that is proof. This is kind of hard to do and play at the same time. Right? But because the bad things jump out of us, you think about the news, right? Think about this. Let me put it this way. I just drove in from Boston last night. And I drove into Burlington. So just imagine, I'm going to make up a story. Imagine that three people cut me off as soon as I get into Burlington, right? What do I do? I do what everybody does. I curse the whole city. I say, none of these people in Burlington can drive, right? When it was only three. Those three stand out because the thousands of others did it right. But we don't bless the ones that do it right. We forget about them because it's normal. So it may be up to us to remind the world of what it really is. And I love the fact that I get to speak to you because I'm usually speaking to musicians that know nothing about the outdoors. And to me, you guys are the li liaison. You are like nature's voice. You are the ones that are speaking to us that don't listen, that don't hear nature. Maybe we'll listen to you, right? Many of us won't speak back to nature, but you will. So you're at that middle ground, and I appreciate and thank you for doing what you do. When I was younger, in the early 90s, I read a book by a man named Tom Brown Jr. And the book changed my life, changed my viewpoint, I would say. So I went to go take a, a class with Tom Brown. And I didn't know what this nature thing was about. At least I didn't think I did. And Tom Brown started talking about awareness, wide angle vision and tracking. Tom was drawing tracks on the board and he was showing me about the gates and he was drawing these little circles. And in my mind, because I was thinking musical, I took these little tracks and put little stems on them. And in my mind, I made them into musical notes. And it made sense right away. And it was that time that I realized that for me, music and nature were the same thing. To me, nature, what you guys are doing is the, is the, is the, is the bridge between all of lives. So back then, and uh, not long after that, a few years after that, I started running a musical camp where we combine music and nature. 
And it literally is changing people's lives. Literally is changing people's lives. And I'm saying that not to talk about me, but to say that that's what your world is. You get to change people's lives in a good way. working with a man named Bela Fleck for over 20 years and I learned a lot about leadership from him I always felt that music is a good way to address the world's issues to be in a band the best bands I've ever played in all the instruments were different and we don't curse those differences we bless them that's why I think the whole world should learn to play music. Then we might understand that differences are a blessing, not a curse. Bela Fleck always said that he was a leader among equals. Even though the band had his name in it twice, he still treated us as equals. Whenever he would bring a new song to the table, he would never tell us what to play. He would just play his part and allow us to hear the song fresh. Bela rec uh, recognized that I would probably come up with a better bass part than him. I've never written a banjo part for him. So he would let me hear the song and come up with my own part. And as simple as that was, I realized that's the way to lead. He led in a way that brought out the best in us. If he had just told us what to play, he would have gotten his idea across. But I wouldn't have grown from it as much. So as you guys go out and become world leaders, which many of you will, lead in a way that brings out the best in people. and be a leader among equals. couple of ideas to leave with you. You're going to need a lot of guts to get out there and do what you do. For some of you, when I was getting an explanation of what a lot of you are going to be doing after you graduate, a lot of your jobs, are, I would say, are a thankless job. You won't get the awards that I've gotten for just plucking on some strings, right? But I hope you're like me and not do your job for awards, but to do it because it's right. Because it's what the world needs. My aunt told me a story recently when she was at my house for a family reunion back in the 70s. We were all young. I saw, I'm sorry, in the 80s. And she, my, mom, she, my aunt said my mom was up pacing in the middle of the night. And she asked my mom what was going on. My mom was agitated. 
She said, my mom said, all my friends are getting on me because I didn't go see my sons play at the Coliseum. And they think, well, you don't care about your son. You didn't. She said, I don't need to see them. I know my son. I've been knowing him my whole life. I've been seeing him play every day. I don't need to go see him at the Coliseum. She said, my friends think my sons are special because they play at the Coliseum. And the thing I didn't say is at this family reunion, we had probably 60 people. One of my brothers was sleeping under the kitchen table. Another one was in the chair. Another one was sleeping in the garage, you know. And my mom said, I don't care that they're getting awards and the fact that they're playing at the Coliseum. She said, I care about the fact that they'll play at the Coliseum and then come home and sleep on the floor. And if my mom were here right now, she'd say, that's what I'm talking about. It's who you are as people. And you bring who you are to what you do. You're going to have to get creative. You guys are the future and a lot of what you're going to need to do hadn't even been invented yet. So I'm just going to pose one idea about creativity and inspiration. A lot of times when you get inspired, you get creative. You feel a certain way. It's like being happy. There's a tingle. For me, my body starts to tingle. I say the next time it happens, you feel creative. Maybe like today. Remember this feeling. Put it in a data bank somewhere and remember what it feels like. Because one of the things I have learned to do through a lot of training with people like Matt and my other nature friends. I've learned the creative process, the inspiration process in reverse. When I need an idea, I create the feeling. I remember what inspiration feels like. And I can create the feeling and the inspiration arrives, it shows up. So practice it. It might work. In parting, I just want you to imagine that as a graduation gift, each of you was awarded $36,525. Not bad. But here's the catch. You're not going to get any more for the rest of your lives. So think about it. $36,525 you have cash, but you're not getting any more. Any more. Think about it. How would you treat that money? How would you handle it? I'm sure some of you would take very good care of it, spend it wisely, spend it on things that matter, maybe invest, give to people in need. Thirty-six thousand five hundred twenty-five. 
Well, if you live to be 100, if you live to be 100, that's 36,525 days, including leap years. So a dollar a day, and you can probably not buy a house. And that's if you live to be 100. If you're male, cut off a bunch of years. <laughs> if you're a person of color, cut off a bunch more years. First few years of your life, you don't even make your own decisions. They tell us to sleep eight, eight hours a day. That's a third. Uh, that's a year every three years. Time spent playing Candy Crush. How many days are actually left? There's a saying that says the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is now. The best time to start living your life was 20 years ago. The next best time is now. The world is in the palm of your hands. You can create whatever you want. I just say do it wisely. And do it with others in your mind. Because when you include others as yourself, then it's okay to be selfish. My name is Victor Wooten. And I congratulate you guys. And I thank you in advance for all the beautiful work you're going to do. What does the world need with just another musician? What the world needs is good people. Thank you, Mom. When the going gets tough, that's a positive signal to keep charging. Thank you all very much. Thank you all. Y'all are graduates. I love you. Thank you very much.